Good morning, everyone. I am Mauricio Villavicencio, Surgical Director of Lung Transplantation at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And on behalf of the STS workforce on end-stage cardiopulmonary disease, I'd like to present you a practical approach to the invaluable tool of ECMO in lung transplantation with emphasis in intraoperative venous arterial ECMO. ECMO bridges in lung transplantation have become increasingly more common in the U.S. with nearly 6% of all lung transplant performed on ECMO since 2019. In 2010, only 1% of the lung transplant were bridges. The main indications are young cystic fibrosis or interstitial lung disease patients suffering from worsening hypoxemia in spite of high oxygen concentrations on a rebreather mask, BiPAP, or a high flow cannula about two or already intubated. In regards to hypercarbia, we recommend ECMO once persistent respiratory acidosis occurs. In general terms, it's our preference to start ECMO as soon as the patient is near invasive mechanical ventilation. Most of the time, only VV ECMO is necessary, but if there is severe pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction, hemodynamic compromise, a venous arterial ECMO is needed. Sometimes there is pressure requirement related to the hypoxemia or the hypercarbia that can be resolved quickly putting the patient on VV ECMO. Therefore, if there's pressure requirement, the patient might need only VV ECMO. So uh, judgment of how the cardiac function is essential. The central goal with the VV ECMO is to rehabilitate before transplant and the ideal circumstance is an ambulating patient of mechanical ventilation. Tracheostomies are common and helpful. Contraindications are preexisting multi-organ dysfunction, age over 65 years old, prolonged mechanical ventilation, uncontrolled sepsis, frailty, neurologic dysfunction, and other significant comorbidities like a, a high body mass index, coronary artery disease, or severe deconditioning. Um, Interoperative venous arterial ECMO in lung transplants. So first, I would like to mention the advantages and drawbacks when compared to cardiopulmonary bypass. First is the versatility. ECMO can be continued postoperatively. Second, it requires a lower amount of anticoagulation and causes less inflammation. There are series that have shown decreased primary graft dysfunction, and this is also our empiric observation. Long ECMO runs, as opposed to cardiopulmonary bypass, cause less hemolysis and thrombocytopenia. And lastly, it needs a lower priming volume. The uh, drawbacks are minimal or no air management uh, capability. There is uh, worse heart, heart decompression and venting is difficult or not possible. It does not allow open left atrium or pulmonary artery anastomosis. Large surgical bleeding is more difficult to manage since there's no pump and suction, and simultaneous cabbage is possible, but not open heart surgery. Most of the time, the, co the conditions that favor cardiopulmonary bypass are not present. So ECMO is our election in more than 95% of uh, the cases when cardiorespiratory support is needed. The venous arterial ECMO indications uh, for a lung transplant can be divided in planned and unplanned. Among those plans are severe pulmonary hypertension and RV dysfunction again, so the patient will not tolerate pulmonary artery clamping. Also, uh, it's our preference that redo lung transplant or status post major thoracic surgery with lobectomies um, can have significant bleeding that can occur dissecting the pulmonary artery from the bronchus. So we prefer to have the pulmonary artery decompressed. The third indication would be center policy. You know, some centers do all lung transplants on ECMO. It has the benefit of not exposing the first implanted lung to the full cardiac output like in off-pump lung transplantation. And last but not least, uh, severe hypercardic respiratory failure may require VV ECMO to avoid further respiratory acidosis. The unplanned indication. Uh, I think the most common one that we have encountered is pulmonary edema, desaturation, and pulmonary hypertension after the first lung is implanted and the second lung is down during off-pump lung transplant. Uh, the second one will be hemodynamic intolerance after clamping of the pulmonary artery during the first pneumonectomy. And third will be uncontrolled air leaks with low tidal volume, so impossible to ventilate and with a fire risk. So what are the cannulation strategies we recommend? Uh, first, we would like to have seen here in the, in the picture uh, to put micropunctures on four French, in French catheters in the femoral vessels and in the right internal jugular vein for possible emergent VA or VV ECMO as, as shown in here. 
we prefer central or, uh, sending aorta cannulation. And in order to minimize the risk of air entry, we prefer percutaneous femoral vein cannulation, avoiding suture placements in the right atrium. In restricted disease, the mediastinal retraction can produce significant drops in the ECMO flow. And consequently, we add an SVC cannula to, through the right atrial appendage and a snare tourniquet around it to avoid air entry. The ECMO flow tends to be more stable with this configuration in fibrotic disease. Our protocol for anticoagulation and air embolism prevention, we have progressively used less and less anticoagulation. So our current bolus is uh, heparin 0 0.6 milligram per uh, kilogram as initial bolus, and then an ACT between 160 and 200 with further boluses. We do not give heparin if there's diffuse uh, bleeding, especially from dense adhesions. Immediately after cannulation, we flush the cannulas with saline before starting the flow to avoid any blood stagnation in the cannula. Air embolism prevention is very important and we think about it as the Achilles heel of ECMO during lung transplantation. So we have created a protocol about uh, this. First, uh, we create team awareness uh, at the lung transplant huddle about this uh, potentially devastating complication. We give attention to the new members of the team not familiar with this complication, and this is emphasized. The perfusionist check the air with the air monitoring device in the circuit at all times for air. No catheters, need, uh, they need to have the ports open. So, and it's very important for the surgeon to perform immediate venous bleeding hemostasis, drop the flow if venous ble bleeding occurs until you're able to fix it. Um, then we need to have a cardiopulmonary bypass uh, circuit prime immediately available and maintain hopefully uh, a CVP on the high range around 10 or higher and avoid chattering interacting with anesthesia to avoid volume depletion. So what to do with a patient that's bridged with BV ECMO? First of all, most of the time you're able to perform the lung transplant just on BV ECMO. Uh, the need to convert to venous arterial, it could be for pulmonary hypertension or right ventricular dysfunction or hemodynamic compromise. And there are two possibilities. The two circuit configuration, in which you can only separate it for a VA ECMO run, and then run the VV circuit at low flows, one to 1.5 liters per minute that initiate the VA ECMO. Avoid clamping of the VV circuit is for any reason this is done, it has to be removed because of the blood stasis. And then we have the one circuit set up, which is convert the VV to VAV ECMO, adding a Y connector, and the flows of each limb can be adjusted with clamps. The winning and pos uh, postoperative ECMO. So after a 15 minute uh, period of uh, control reperfusion with a mean PA pressure of uh, 15 millimeters of mercury after each lung, we're ready to come off ECMO. The circuit is clapped, the venous supply is divided and submerged in a basin of saline, taking care of not introducing any air. The ECMO circuit volume is reinfused. We think that this step is critical to recover from the typical hypertension occurring after circuit clamping. The cannulation and protamine follows. The Vienna group has published parameters to continue with VA ECMO through the groin, which are a BFIO2 ratio less than 100, mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than two-thirds of systemic and worsening between two time points. In our experience, it's uncommon to need VA ECMO postoperatively. Most of the time, VA ECMO suffices with exception of primary pulmonary hypertension, and we believe it has less uh, morbidity. So similar to the increase in the ECMO bridge to transplant, postoperative ECMO has uh, risen to 8% of all lung transplants 72 hours in the ECMO database. As discussed previously, we recommend early use on primary gas dysfunction with a low PFIO2 ratio and high airway pressures. Pulmonary edema subsides quickly, rendering good results most of the time. In our experience, permits protective ventilation and a rapid winning whenever negative fluid balance is possible. We hope you enjoyed this quick ECMO and lung transplantation summary. 